love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, it will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story to be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest and when in scenes of glory I sing a new new song to will be the old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story to be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love. Good morning, and once again, your family here at United Baptist Church welcomes you to our worship service this morning. Oh, my goodness. Special thanks if you are listening on the radio. Oh, my goodness. You have tuned in or stayed tuned in this morning and are listening there. Special thanks to those folks, those dedicated folks there at the radio station and all their hard work in uh, making sure this broadcast gets out to you. Or maybe you're watching on our website there, ubctopson.org, and you've clicked on the sermon link, and you're watching with us this morning. Thank you so much for taking that time and uh, doing that and, and that desire to, to join us. <laughs> and uh, special thanks to all the folks here at United Baptist for their hard work and dedication in making sure that these broadcasts come to you also. It truly does take a village in order for this to be uh, broadcast out in the different media and everything. So uh, we appreciate all of the hard work of all those that have even a little piece in uh, making sure things get out. Our joke for the day. I got excited when my son joined the cross country team at school. But then I learned they really don't run all the way across the country, and they're back home and within a couple hours after practice. <laughs> oh, anyway, uh, I have a couple of questions 
for you this morning. And I think I know the answer to both of them, but here we go. First, I think we have all had that feeling after returning from a trip, that wonderful feeling of being home. Isn't that one of the best feelings in the world? It doesn't seem to matter what the trip itself was. Maybe it was a vacation, a holiday, or, or a business trip, or even the outcome of the trip. Maybe it was the best trip we've ever taken, or we went to some place that we'd like to go and again and again and again. Or maybe it was a disaster. <laughs> Been on some of those trips. <laughs> a disaster from the get-go, and we never want to go back or repeat that situation again. But still, there's just something euphoric about coming home, about getting home. We have that overwhelming feeling that we just belong here, right? And then my second question is, have you ever been to somewhere or some place that you felt like you just didn't belong there? As you look around, you notice more and more reasons why you should leave <laughs> and quicker than later. <laughs> As you look around, you, you see that we've all experienced something similar. A few summers back, um, we went out to California. My wife and I and, and our kids went to, to one of my wife's family reunions out there in California. And they have a big reunion every other year where families from all over the country attend we have one coming up here in just a few weeks where it's going to be down in Texas this year. But this particular year, it was out in California, and uh, it was out in the uh, Los Angeles area. And now I never dreamed that I would feel like an outsider within the continental United States. I, there's just that feeling of, of no matter where I am in the in the States, I, I feel better, feel, don't feel out of place. Now, I did have a friend, and I've never been to Hawaii, but I had a friend who was stationed out in Hawaii for two years uh, doing some work out there on the islands. And he reported back to me that he really did, for those two years, he and his family were definitely the foreigners there. And yet... When we was out in California, <laughs> we were headed to the beach for one of the activities that the family had, and we stopped to get some water and some treats at the corner convenience store. Now, as we walked in, the place was busy, but not overly crowded. But we began to pick out our odds and ends for our day on the beach, and we get in line, and we get up to the counter, and the guy there asks us where we're from. How did he know, <laughs> okay, that we were from anywhere other from than just down the street? We pulled up in a rental car, but it had California tags on it. We, our clothes, we had beach clothes on. I mean, swimming suits and all the very appropriate with all the other folks that were there in the store at the time. And we hadn't said anything that might detect the dialect difference in our in our state, how, how did he know that we were from away? We answered that at the time. Yeah, he was right. We were from Kansas. And one of the other folks in the line just behind us said that they would have guessed that we were from Iowa or, or Michigan. <laughs> and as I looked around, there was a difference. To these folks that lived on the beach, of course, right off the bat, we were about three shades, if not more, lighter in skin color <laughs> than those that had been tanning all summer long at the beach. Without us realizing it, we had been pegged as outsiders the moment they had laid their eyes on us. We were different. We were not like them. To the locals, yes, we would even be considered peculiar. <laughs> That's why the man behind the counter asked, where are you from? 
We're going to take a look at that here in our scripture this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 4. We're going to read through verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 4 as we read together. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which was also what they were destined for. But you who are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your provision for us, Lord. Just this week, you have sent rain our way, and you have protected and, and uh, uh, seen us through the storms. Lord, thank you for your presence with us right here and right now. Thank you for the message that you have for each of us through your word, through the words that you have given me, a message that is for us. Continue to help us to keep our eyes and our hearts and our ears open to witness you more and more in our daily lives. And Lord, I would just pray here and now that you would take the words of my mouth and you would take the meditations of all of our hearts and that you would make them acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Now here we read this portion of Scripture taken from the first book of Peter. We have looked at the Scriptures from 1 Peter for a couple of weeks now, here in the last few weeks, and how appropriate it is to review Peter's teachings here because he is reminding the folks of his day and us here today just what an impact on our lives that Jesus has for us in his death and resurrection. It wasn't that long ago we celebrated Easter, right? And that makes a permanent mark, a permanent uh, uh, way for us that changes uh, the way we live. We remember how Peter is writing to Christians that have been scattered due to severe persecution in Rome. They felt the pressure of believing in Jesus and having the belief has marked them as criminals. They have heard or even witnessed family and friends killed because of their faith in Jesus. So what can Peter offer to these folks as a way of encouragement? First, we remember that Peter reminded them that what Jesus gives us is imperishable that eternal life. The things of this world will pass away, but the life he provides will never pass away. 
Peter goes on to tell us that we will face trials and persecutions for our faith. This life we live is not a cakewalk. But he also tells us that it is through these trials and troubles that our faith, he told us, is purified, much like the heat and the fire that purifies gold. It separates the impurities, and what is left is more pure than before the fire process. Peter tells us that God is pleased when we pass the test. He's not pleased because we suffer, no, but he is pleased because we remain in him through our sufferings. And then we are reminded just last week as we took a look at the Gospel of John, where John tells us that Jesus is the gate to the sheepfold. And if we follow him because we know his voice, his purpose is to provide the way to God. And he demonstrated that to us by serving. When we follow him, we follow his example by serving others. And now we see that when we follow this shepherd, all right, <laughs> we are in fact, as Peter puts it here, living stones returning home. If you get that, just for a minute, returning home. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. When we receive Jesus into our heart, like, like uh, we do, our name then becomes written in the Lamb's book of life. Our citizen, citizenship transfers into heaven's roles. In Luke chapter 10, it, it tells of the return of the disciples of Jesus. He had sent them out, you'll remember, two by two out into the world to be his witnesses. And they came back there in Luke chapter 10, kind of gives a, a summary of it. And uh, they are marveling about how even the demons submitted to them in Jesus' name. Jesus' reply to them is also something we need to remember. In Luke chapter 10, verse 20, it says, Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. <laughs> Peter tells us right here as we just read that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. One of the translations actually says a peculiar people. We should stand out in a crowd, right? We should be recognized as being different. We should be recognized as being peculiar. The locals should be able to spot us as soon as they see us. Peter reminds us that we were once one of those locals. <laughs> without hope, without mercy, but through, through Jesus... We have received it all. And yet, we're not to be prideful about it. No, no, we're not to hold it over anyone. No. Because <laughs> Peter then instructs us how to live as the chosen people of God that we are. To live such good lives that even though lives will be told against us, that even the accusers will see our works and will glorify God. Even as they are accusing us of doing all these things, they will see the body of work that is being done, and through that, they will glorify God. When we get out of our cars, even though our license plate may be the same as the locals, will the people of the world see that we're not from around here? Will they notice that there is something different about us, something peculiar about the way we act to the situations that surround us? Will they see actions from us that they have not seen before, Acts, actions that show them a glimpse 
of God and his love? Oh, they may not recognize it as being a godly attribute at first, but they will recognize it as being different than what they have witnessed from others. And they will wonder and they will actually desire that very same thing for themselves. Because we see there is a spiritual part of each of us that is drawn to God. Drawn to God and drawn to the things of God. Some will recognize it, yet they will choose to ignore it or discredit their attraction or even try to substitute their spiritual attraction with something else. I love the, the story, the picture that someone once said that in each of our hearts, there is a God-shaped hole. And when we try to fill it in with anything else, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, when, you, when you're trying to force that piece in there that doesn't belong, right? It just doesn't fit. It just doesn't happen. It takes the exact piece, that God piece that goes in to our hearts. And when we try to substitute, it just doesn't work. And we remember that it is the Holy Spirit's job to continue to remind everyone that that peace isn't going to work, that that peace isn't going to fit. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us of our sin and to show God's love and grace for each and every person. He has that peace that needs to go there within our hearts. And when we listen to the Holy Spirit, when we believe his message and we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that peace fits right into the puzzle. And then we are to live this life as aliens, strangers in this world, because we realize that this is not our home. We need not get too comfortable here. This life is only temporary. Our true home, our true home is in heaven itself. And on that day, when we lay our bags down at the feet of Jesus, when we lay our suitcases down at the feet of Jesus, he looks us in the eye and tells us, welcome home, you belong here. What a day that will be. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for your love and your mercy, your grace, your watch care, your provision, Lord. I thank you that you are our rock, our fortress, our anchor when things get so crazy in this world and it seems like everything is falling apart, you are there for us. You never have changed, and you have never gone away. We don't have to return back to the spot where we left you. All we need to do is turn, and you are right there with us and for us to get us back onto the right track, to show us your love for us so that we can love you also. We love you because you first loved us. Father, thank you for this opportunity to realize that you have set us aside, that this chaotic mess of a world that we live in is not our home. We have the eternal hope of heaven itself, and a piece of that dwells within us right here and now. Thank you, Father. And gracious God, we come before you now, not only with our hearts and our minds, but Lord, we want to lift our voices in prayer to you. There was a day when the disciples themselves noticed what a difference that prayer made in Jesus' life. And they came to him and they said, Rabbi, teach us to pray. And Jesus took them. And he gave them this instruction, this prayer that we pray to you now. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.